thank you, Mr. Shearer, for the introduction, and thank you for the organizers, especially uh, Stefan for his patience with my tardiness in answering emails. I'm, and thank you all for coming, of course. Um, so, okay. Um, my remarks today will be in two parts. The first um, is about what I call Monstrum Arabicus. And the second will be a reading of um, two poems and an excerpt from my novel. So, the expansive and majestic encyclopedia of 21st century monsters, compiled by a group of leading scholars and experts, is still a work in progress and has yet to be published. <clears throat> Not much is known about its methodology and scope, but we know for sure that one of its entries is dedicated to Monstrum Arabicus. Although medieval sounding and seemingly fictitious, this being slash monster is alive and well in our present moment. Even if its sightings are very rare, its traces can be easily detected in various sites and moments on a global scale. The fear it generates is visceral and considerable, as I will try to demonstrate in my remarks. It is not easy to provide a description or an illustration of the shape of Monstrum Arabicus, as it is quite elusive and shape-shifting. But one can safely say that it has 28 tentacles um, and they are identical to the letters of the Arabic alphabet. What you see is just an approximation. And this was, if you have not realized, a kind of playful Borgesian introduction to my subject. How long has this monster been in existence? This question cannot be answered easily or in a, in a satisfactory manner. Its genealogy is complicated and a matter of debate. However, I contend that while it has existed for a long time, the 9-11 moment and the now permanent war on terror and its discourse engendered a metamorphosis through which Monstrum Arabicus became what it is today. The 9-11 attacks were officially framed in cultural and civilizational terms rather than as an event with a genealogy better understood in terms of geopolitics and recent history, that, of course, would have entailed a critical look at US and Western foreign policy and the costs and consequences of alliances with brutal regimes and support for sacred wars against evil empires. Actually, just two weeks ago, and this bears mentioning, this big new Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, died. His death reminded many of us of his decisive role in theorizing and encouraging jihad, as I like when jihad was cool and was not evil. An old clip resurfaced last month where he addresses a group of Afghani jihadists telling them, quote, God is on your side. You can find it on YouTube. A year or so later, Ronald Reagan received jihadists, bearded, turbaned Muslim Afghani men in the Oval Office and compared them to the founding fathers of the United States because they were freedom fighters. So rather than wasting a lot of time and effort in debating Islamic theology, one simply, not so simply, has to just look at these 20 years and what happened. Uh, that, I assure you, will provide a better understanding of the roots of, of jihad. Now, thanks to an already established and powerful archive of Orientalism, whatever that entails in a way of this look at a monolithic culture that is largely static in the past and so on and so forth, thanks to that powerful archive, which has its potent effects and practices, a monolithic Islam could once again, after 9-11, be invoked and used to easily and efficiently reduce multiple and complicated categories, histories, identities, and being all into one. 
And here's another nicer illustration, of course, of the Monstrum Arabicus. This being a clash of civilizations and cultures, culture itself, no matter how difficult it is to frame culture, became a permanent crime scene that had to be better demarcated and understood. Arabic, the language of Islam's scripture, the lingua franca of the classical period of Islamic civilizations, and the one used by the terrorists was deemed a language of what I call forensic interest. If not outright, it was criminalized in a way. Government and corporate resources in the US were increased and channeled to train linguists and create and sustain experts on Islam. Monstrum Arabicus, of course, feeds and feeds on Monstrum Islamicus. And needless to say, the two are uh, often conflated and interchangeable. And also, Muslims and Arabs are often conflated and interchangeable. One detects also a general paradox in the rush to decode, translate, and create strategic knowledge. On the one hand, the core of this culture of terrorism must be penetrated and mastered. The codes of the essence must be broken, a futile and impossible enterprise, of course, since there is no essence. On the other hand, the core must also somehow remain unattainable and ultimately undecipherable. The combined effect of these two is a constant policing of fictitious boundaries that reproduce the logic of cultural clash, war, and struggle. This is consonant with the logic of the permanent war on terror, a war that produces the conditions that create more of what it purports to destroy. So in other terms, the simultaneous desire to translate and decode and the desire to keep at bay or to assign to untranslatability. If all of this sounds a bit too abstract, I will provide a few examples to support what I'm saying. Um, I should say, of course, that the logic and practices of the war on terror have been generalized and normalized across the globe with variations by various regimes. Um, what the first example is the curious untranslatability of Allah, which is something that I noticed as soon as I arrived in the United States in 1991, but I think that after 9-11, it acquires more importance. The signifier Allah in Arabic is, is the case in point. In various media, genres, and contexts, there is a resistance to translating the word and rendering it in English simply as God with a capital G. This, of course, would risk indicating the fact that Allah is merely the monotheistic God of the so-called Abrahamic religions. And this would encroach on some important boundaries and squander the alien quality and effect of a word left untranslated and then untranslatable. Another example is the curious untranslatability of the dialogues of terrorists. And they are predominantly Muslim and Arab in many films. While even the most despicable and monstrous characters of serial killers and other hideous villains get the permission to narrate and speak, the dialogue of terrorists is often left untranslated, or it isn't in any recognizable language, merely barbarous sounds of khe, for example. Admittedly, this is the case often in blockbuster films, but even in the, so for example, the Munich film by Spielberg, everyone's dialogue is translated, but the terrorists, for some reason, the audience doesn't need to know what they're saying. Now, more recent examples, I'm sure you know about them, is this the, the removal of passengers uttering Arabic words on flights in the United States, or passengers wearing t-shirts that have the Arabic script on it. Another important example from my, now my hometown of New York City, in terms of the, another example of the sense of danger that Arabic generates. In 2007, there were plans to open a bilingual Arabic-English public school in New York City. That was greeted with suspicion and active opposition for fear that such a school might become a hotbed of radicalism and indoctrination. It also says something about this, the 
the potency of Arabic in and of itself, mere exposure to the Arabic language would potentially turn people into terrorists. Even though in New York City there are dozens of dual language schools that teach Spanish, French, Mandarin, Chinese, and Haitian Creole, and so on and so forth. None of these schools, of course, generate even a fraction of the controversy that this Arabic school has. Another notorious example was that in the um, usually colleges have universities uh, choose a book for the incoming freshman class to read. And I think it was in 2005 when the University of North Carolina chose uh, a, tr a translation into English of the Quran for the students to read. And there was, again, another huge controversy because the parents were afraid that if their, you know, their children read the Quran, God knows what's going to happen to them. So anyway, the last example, it's different in that, this, again, the, the forensic interest in the culture, which happens at many levels in that the New Yorker, one of the premier cultural journals in the country, which rarely has any interest in modern Arabic poetry, publishes an article by two scholars entitled Battle Lines. Want to understand the jihadists? Question mark. Read their poetry. So I quote this from the article. Al-Qaeda and other Islamist movements produce a huge amount of verse. The vast majority of it circulates online in a clandestine network of social media accounts, mirror sites, and proxies, which appear and disappear with bewildering speed, thanks to surveillance and hacking. On militant websites, poetry discussion forums feature couplets on current events, competitions among poets who try to outdo one another in, in virtuosic feats and downloadable collections with scholarly accoutrements, and so on and so forth. So the key sentence, analysts have generally ignored these texts as if poetry were a colorful but ultimately distracting byproduct of jihad. But this is a mistake. It is impossible. These two major scholars from very prestigious universities tell us it is impossible to understand jihadism, its objectives, its appeal for new recruits, and its durability without examining its culture. Now, as a poet and as a scholar of poetry, I actually think it's quite the opposite. This is one case where actually we can do away and no need to understand jihadism just as with the examples I mentioned above, one needs to look at geopolitical history and foreign affairs rather than looking at some kind of essence. And this happening in this being written in 2016 is one example of going back to um, old and traditional um, Orientalist ideas. Now, there is much more to say, but I don't have a lot of time. But this is the, the case that I want to make. And this has you know, major consequences, of course. And we can talk about that in the Q&A. Now, the second part is, as the introduction said, is that unfortunately, um, I lived 23 years in a country that suffered from dictatorship, but afterwards actually suffered the consequences of the war on terror. Because the 2003 invasion of Iraq is uh, a product of the discourse of the war on terror. And whatever one may say about dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, and I've written a lot about it, um, we were talking about this now, the invasion also um, exposed Iraq to international terrorism and ended up destroying an already fragile society. And so sadly, or unfortunately, a lot of my writing, of course, has to do with um, themes about what happens to this society and the civil war that is suffered. Um, so I'll read one poem, which is called An Ordinary Day, and then an excerpt from a novel. It was an ordinary day, except my father was very late. My mother screamed when she opened the door. He was headless his clothes smeared with blood. He hugged her to calm her down, but she kept crying. He said he wouldn't be able to watch TV with us anymore. We would never eat together again. He gave my little brother his pillow, asked us to listen to mother and to do our homework. Then he knelt to pray, thanking God for what was left. 
My little sister cried a lot. Then she beheaded her doll and buried its head in our backyard. Now, the excerpt I'm going to read is from a novel called The Pomegranate Alone in the original Arabic. In the English, it's called The Corpse Washer. It's sort of about a person who is born into a family of traditional corpse washers, but he has artistic tendencies and rebels against his father and wants to become an artist. But dictatorship, economic collapse, and sanctions, and then the war force him to do the very same profession that he tried to run away from. And in the civil war that ensued after the American invasion, there was a massive killing, of course. So the bodies pile up. He makes a lot of money, but his daily life is, and his psyche is traumatized. So this is just an, the opening uh, section. Uh, she is lying naked on her back on a marble bench in an open place with no walls or ceilings. There is no one around and nothing in sight except sand, which reached all the way to the horizon where clouds crowded the sky and blocked the sun by turns before rushing out of sight. I too was naked, barefoot, dumbfounded by everything around me. I can feel the sand under my feet and a cool wind. I move slowly toward the bench. When and why has she come back after all these years? Her long black hair is piled about her head. A few locks cover her right cheek, as if guarding her face, which has not changed with the years. Her eyebrows are carefully plucked, and her eyelids, which ended in thick eyelashes, were shut. Her nose guards her lips, bare, which bear pink lipstick on them as if she were still alive. Her nipples are erect and there is no trace of the surgery. Her hands are clasped over her navel. Her fingernails and toenails are painted the same pink as her lipstick. I wonder whether she is asleep or dead. I am afraid to touch her. I look into her face and whisper her name, Reem. She smiles, her eyes still shut first. Then she opens them, and the blackness in her pupils smiles as well. I can't grasp what is going on. I ask in a loud voice, Reem, what are you doing here? I am about to hug and kiss her, but she warns me, don't kiss me. Wash me first so we can be together. What, are you still alive? Wash me so we can be together. I missed you so much. But you are not dead. Wash me, darling, wash me so we can be together. With what? There is nothing here. Wash me. Raindrops begin to fall and she closes her eyes. I wipe a drop off her nose with my index finger. Her skin is warm, which means she was alive. I start to caress her hair. I will wash her with the rain, I think. She smiles as if she'd heard my thought. Another drop settles above her left eyebrow. I wipe it off. I think I hear the sound of a car approaching. I turn around and see a Humvee driving at an insane speed, leaving a trail of flying dust. It suddenly swerves to the right and comes to a stop a few meters away. Its doors open, masked men wearing khaki uniforms and carrying machine guns rush toward us. I try to shield Dream with my right hand, but one of the men has already reached me. He hits me in the face with the stock of his machine gun. I fall to the ground. He kicks me in the stomach. Another starts dragging me away from the washing bench. None of them say a word. I am screaming and cursing them, but I can't hear myself. The two men force me to get down on my knees and tie my wrists with a wire behind my neck. One of them puts a knife to my neck. The other blindfolds me. I try to run away, but they hold me tightly. I scream again but cannot hear my screams. I can only hear Reem's shrieks, the laughter and the grunts of the men, and the sound of the rain. I feel a sharp pain, then the cold blade of the knife penetrating my neck. Hot blood spills over my chest and back. My head falls to the ground and rolls like a ball on the sand. I hear footsteps. One of the men takes off my blindfold and shoves it in his pocket. 
He spits in my face and goes away. I see my body to the left of the bench, kneeling in a puddle of blood. The other men return to the Humvee, two of them dragging Reem by her arms. She tries to turn her head back in my direction, but one of them slaps her. I cry out her name, but cannot hear my voice. They put her in the back seat and shut the door. The engine starts. The Humvee speeds away and disappears. The rain keeps falling on the empty bench. I woke up panting and sweating. I wiped my forehead and face. The same nightmare had been recurring for weeks now with minor changes. Sometimes I see Reem's severed head on the bench and hear her voice saying, wash me, darling. But this was the first time there was rain. It must have slipped through from outdoors. I could hear drops on the window. I look at my watch. It's already 3.30 AM. I've only slept three hours after a very long day. Death is not content with what it takes from me in my waking hours. It insists on haunting me even in my sleep. Isn't it enough that I toil all day, tending to its eternal guests, preparing them to sleep in its lap? Is death punishing me because I thought I could escape? If my father were still alive, he would mock me and my silly thoughts. He would dismiss all of this as infantile, unbecoming to a man. Didn't he spend a lifetime doing his job day after day, never once complaining of death? But death back then was timid and more measured than today. I can almost hear death saying, I am what I am and haven't changed at all. I am but a postman. If death is a postman, then I am one of those who receive his letters every day. I am the one who reopens them carefully from their bloodied and torn envelopes. I am the one who washes them, who removes the stamps of death and dries and perfumes them, mumbling what I don't entirely believe in. Then I wrap them carefully in white so they may reach their final reader, the grave. But letters are piling up, Father. Tenfold more than what you used to see in the span of a week now pass before me in one day. If you were alive, Father, would you say that this is fate and God's will? I wish you were here so I could leave Mother with you and escape without feeling guilty. You were heavily armed with faith, and that made your heart a fortified castle. My heart, by contrast, is an abandoned house whose windows are shattered and doors unhinged. Ghosts play inside and the winds wail. Thank you.